Sefer B'midbar, Parshat Chukat, on calmness in leadership. By this point in Sefer B'midbar, in the desert, readers have long asked the question, how did the Israelites get water to drink? They had manna from heaven, but what about water? <clears throat> the rabbis of the Talmud found one clue in Parshat Chukat, in which we read, the people stayed at Kadesh, Miriam died there and was buried there. The community was without water, and they joined against Moshe and Aaron. When Miriam was alive, the Israelites had water, and when she died, they didn't. Surely then Miriam was the source of water. From here we get the Jewish tradition that in the merit of Miriam, the Israelites had a miraculous well that followed them wherever they went. Without Miriam, though, the water was gone. And our Parsha tells us now, the people quarreled with Moshe, saying, if only we had perished when our brothers perished at the instance of the Lord. Why have you brought the Lord's congregation into this wilderness for us and our beasts to die there? Why did you make us leave Egypt to bring us to this wretched place, a place with no grain or figs or vines or pomegranates? There's not even water to drink. God's presence soon appears to Moshe and Aaron, and God says to Moshe, you and your brother Aaron take the rod and assemble the community, and before their very eyes order the rock to yield its water. Thus you shall produce water for them from the rock and provide drink for the congregation and their beasts. Moshe follows God's orders, and then Moshe says, listen, you rebels, Shall we get water for you out of this rock? The Torah tells us. And Moshe raised his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. Out came copious water and the community and their beasts drank. Then for reasons that have confused readers for millennia, God says to Moshe and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to affirm my sanctity in the sight of the Israelite people, therefore you shall not lead this congregation into the land that I have given them. As we know, resulting from this incident, Moshe and Aaron both die before the end of the Torah and the respective ages of 120 and 123, and neither of them makes it to the promised land. But why? Why did the brothers actually do, what did they actually do that demonstrated a lack of trust or public reverence? According to Rashi, who liked to find the Torah's most straightforward answer, Moshe's disrespect came in the way he hit the rock to produce water rather than speaking to it as he had been specifically instructed. Rashi comments that if Moshe had simply spoken to the rock, the Israelites would have thought, what is the case with this rock which cannot speak and cannot hear and needs no maintenance? It fulfills the bidding of the omnipresent God. How much more should we do so? But instead, the Israelites see Moshe using the rock as a mere tool for the benefit of their own comfort, hence the offense to God's sanctity. That's Rashi. In the world of Nachmanides, the Ramban, the sin came from Moshe saying, shall we get water for you out of this rock? As if it were Moshe and Aro, not God, miraculously sustaining the Israelites. However, according to Maimonides, the Rambam, the sin at hand was Moshe's growing anger with the people. Listen, you rebels, Moshe seemed to yell. Rambam points out that Moshe, as the greatest prophet, is a representative of God. And if Moshe is angry with the people, they will think God is angry at them. The sin here, then, is Moshe's misrepresentation of God's will. I think Rambam's critique of Moshe provides us with a lesson that is still crucial today. It's often easy and tempting for leaders to become angry at those who follow them. Yes, just as the Israelites blamed and complained to Moshe, we often deal with seemingly unfair criticism in their own leadership roles, be them at work, at home, or in our communities. But it is the job of a leader to demonstrate kindness and focus despite what they perceive as mistreatment. Rising above the noise is an indispensable leadership skill. 
A true leader, we learn from the Jewish tradition, resists being set off by the accusations of agitated masses because they know that such complaints are not personal, but the result of the frustrations they encounter in their own lives. To be sure, there is a place for leaders to respond to criticism, but they must do so with calculation and introspection, not unfiltered emotion. There's nothing wrong with being angry, and we should find healthy spaces to process that. But leadership requires the ability to contain anger and channel emotions in a direction that benefits everyone. It's not always enjoyable to wholeheartedly serve those who seem to be out to get you. And sometimes the slights against you from any unappreciative per people can quickly add up. But that is the burden that comes with leadership. On the other side of the equation, those in follower roles are certainly capable of making the leader's jobs easier. We don't need to be like the complaining masses, and we can instead focus on all our mentors do for us, rather than making their lives difficult. And sometimes, a person has done the taxing work for leading people for simply longer than they can handle, and the gap between a leader and their followers grows too large for the old arrangement to remain in place. A person might even reach a level of experience and accomplishment so great that they can no longer relate to the average community member. Just as a CEO might have no way to be on the same page as an intern, Moshe, who led the Israelites out of Egypt and communed with God on Mount Sinai, was maybe living in virtually an entirely different world than that of those he was leading. The Israelites, as they came closer to entering the land of Israel, were approaching a new stage with new kinds of demanding challenges for whoever the leader would be. Perhaps God knew that Moshe and Aaron's time needed to soon be up, that it had to be Joshua who would lead a new generation of Israelites on a new journey. Readers of the Torah are probably right in that there was nothing terribly wrong with what Moshe did. But perhaps it was a small sign that Moshe no longer had the same level of patience to be as understanding and compassionate of a leader as he had been, as great as that had been. Even if his patience and humility were far beyond all others, these were extraordinary times that required near perfection in character. Moshe was human too, and his story for, is here for us to learn and grow from in, in order that our own character development can flourish. Maybe God was saying that heading into the next stage of Israel's journey, the nation needed the fresh perspective of someone prepared to deal with both God and the Israelites at the same time, whereas Moshe was now more aligned with the will of God than with the will of the people. Perhaps God wasn't so much punishing Moshe as recognizing that it was a decision in the best interest of the collective, that Moshe's time will end at age 120, and Joshua's time to take over would follow. It's one thing to have the abilities and the strength to be a true leader, and it's another to have the wisdom to know what role one needs to take at each particular time in their life. Sefer Bamidbar, Parshat Balak, on being a people that dwells apart. In Parshat Balak, we read the famous blessing given to Israel from Bilam. As I see them from the mountaintops, gaze on them from the heights, there is a people that dwells apart, not reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob, number the dust cloud of Israel? May I die the death of the upright. May my fate be like theirs. Personally, I'm struck by the notion in this blessing of a people that dwells apart. What specifically does that mean? On one hand, the Jewish people, in fact, are a nation that dwells alone. Throughout history, we haven't been able to depend on the benevolence of the rulers around us. And therefore, we've had to stay relatively isolated and wary, erring on the side of keeping to ourselves. And indeed, the traditional Jewish commentators, such as Rashi and the Sforno, read this verse as indicating the dwelling alone means Israel is destined for certain blessings of success and protection. At the same time, 
we read in the book of Isaiah that God says to the nation of Israel, it is too little that you should be my servant in that I raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the survivors of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. Clearly, while the Jewish people do have a separate and unique history and mission in the world, the tradition teaches that the Jewish people are not supposed to live entirely separated. There's a need to develop allyship and bring redemption to the world, not be set aside in solitude. As Jews, we should be proud of our special inheritance and ongoing traditions, though of course not in any way that lowers others or separates us from the world. When other groups experience hate and injustice, we know from our own tradition that we have a duty to show up for them. And from the relationships we build, we hope others will feel called to stand with us in our times of distress as well. Further, while solidarity is crucial pragmatically, we know it is equally important spiritually. As God says in the book of Genesis, it is not good for the human to be alone. Separation, we learn from the Torah, is both a blessing and a curse. One of the best examples of this tension in our world today is the current state of Israel, which is constantly demonized by its neighbors and other nations, and as a tiny state stands alone among those who wish to destroy it. And yet we know that dwelling alone should not be Israel's destiny. Despite current realities, we should not accept separation as a destiny set by God. We know we should instead continue to seek diplomatic engagement, relationship building, and mutual understanding. In fact, the most radicalized Israelis are those who simply don't care anymore what the outside world thinks of them. For those of us who live in places like America, though the question of what it means for the Jewish people to be a nation that dwells apart looks much different. Over the generations, we've had to decide, should we not be separate at all from the general culture? Should we dress, talk, and live just like the wider society? Should our own differences from our neighbors be our religious ones? Most Jews of recent generations, of course, choose and continue to choose a path along those lines of assimilation. Yet there are also those who decided that aside from some limited business activities, and navigating our political self-interests, Jews should totally isolate from the surrounding nation, taking it as a blessing to dwell alone and to be left alone. We can sympathize with both sides of that debate. It makes perfect sense why after centuries of danger and persecution, Jews would, would not be eager to take up the liberal world on its offers to make us relatively safe and accepted. And we also know that the isolationist is not naive to have never forgotten the danger the outside world can pose to the Jewish people. The challenge, one that we've taken on for millennia and that is not at all uncharted territory, is to figure out how to take the good elements from both sides of acculturation and of tradition while leaving behind the damaging ones. Rabbi Shalom Karmi in an essay for Tradition Magazine called A Room with a View, but a room of our own wrote regarding the overlap between Jewish and secular studies. Before we build the palace, we need a place where we can unpack our trunk, get our books out of storage and back into our hands. We want a room with a view, since there is knowledge to be had that we want to have for our enhanced study of Torah. But we cannot do our work. We cannot prepare to build the palace unless we do it in a room of our own. From the complexities of the Torah, we learn that we will need to figure out ways to both dwell alone and dwell together. By holding both our universalistic and particularistic visions together, we can be both a people that lives apart and a light to the nations that need our partnership. By wrestling with these tensions, we can see that there is no contradiction in how one hour we might pray as Jews and the next we might roll up our sleeves to repair society alongside our neighbors. Shabbat Shalom.